So hello everyone, welcome to Innovate to Elevate, Breakthroughs in Donor Acquisition with Matching Gifts, Personalized Touch Points, and Advanced Fundraising Strategies. Today we're gonna go, uh, we're gonna do some welcome and introductions from our amazing panelists that we have. We're gonna hear a little bit from you, talk about some of the biggest challenges nonprofits are facing today, and then also provide you with some strategies for donor acquisition um, through personalized touch points and matching gifts. And we're going to talk a little bit about the technology you can use to achieve that and then answer any questions and answers you do have. And we will be answering questions throughout the session as well. So feel free to submit those in the Q&A and chat box. But to start off, I want to introduce Chris Fink. He is our Chief Operating Officer here at Arriva. Thanks for being here today, Chris. Mm -hmm. We have David Blyer, who is the co-founder and CEO of Arriva. Hi, David. Thanks for being here. Hey, Gabby, thanks for putting this on. Uh, very excited to do this today. Thank you. Yes. And then we have Mackenzie Birch Buckler, who is the Partnership Success and Marketing Specialist with Double the Donation. Thanks for being here, Mackenzie. Yeah, thank you for having me. Excited for this one. Yes. Um, and I'm Gabriela Slemmy. I'm the Digital Marketing Manager here, and I'll be hosting our session today. So to get started, we want to go ahead and hear from um, our audience. Uh, the first question, you're going to see a poll pop up on your screen and go ahead and answer that. It's just, do you feel your donor acquisition is getting easier or harder year after year? Um, if you feel it's getting easier, then you can answer that. I'd be surprised if that's the majority, but uh, maybe you feel it's getting harder or maybe you feel that it's remained the same. Um, so go ahead and let us know what how your donor acquisition experience has been. Um, Give it a few more seconds because we have a lot of answers coming in. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end that and then I'll put those results up for everyone to see. So the majority seem to say harder um, with a few people saying remain the same and slight amount of people saying easier, which is interesting to see. Okay, our next poll to go ahead and get that ready to come up. Um, so what we would like to know next is how many applications are you currently using to manage donor activity? So this can be everything from managing your events to managing memberships, uh, donation pages, grants, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, team fundraising. Are you using multiple applications that they don't communicate with each other and thus you're having to do duplicate entry? Maybe you haven't realized how many different solutions you're using and how many of them don't communicate to e with each other. Um, and this can actually be something that greatly affects your donor acquisition, which we'll talk a little bit more about um, later on today. But we just want to get a feel for the room and where everybody stands. And yes, the session will be recorded and sent to you uh, for anyone who is asking, and you will get a copy of the PowerPoint. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and put these results up. The majority of you tend to be using uh, two or three applications to manage your donor activity, um, with a handful of you using one and then four or five or more, which is interesting to see as well. Okay, and then we have one more poll for you. Um, you can go ahead and switch that slide. So this one is about corporate matching gifts. Um, have you ever leveraged corporate matching gift opportunities within your fundraising and donor outreach efforts before? Maybe you're not familiar with corporate matching gifts. Maybe you think it's you know, too complicated to get something like that into place. And Mackenzie is gonna show you that it's not at all. It's actually very simple. Um, but we would like to know how many of you have used the uh, corporate matching gifts before. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share these results. So it seems like the majority have used with a few um, not having used and then a few people who aren't sure. Um, but that's great, that's what we're here for. We're gonna show you ways to improve and to implement corporate matching gifts. Okay, thank you for answering our questions, everyone. I'm gonna pass it over to our panelists now. Thanks, Gabby. That poll was awesome, and it was very helpful to uh, set the stage on what we're 
presenting today. And uh, I just want to thank uh, Mackenzie and Chris for joining the panel conversation. And I think we're going to get a lot out of this today. And uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to make this extremely as interactive as you would like. But we do see some of the biggest challenges today facing all of you. And um, and really in those three categories that we're seeing is, is it's really about donor acquisition and donor engagement and donor retention. And um, and, and today we're only speaking about donor acquisition, and I know this is going to be a very short time, so hopefully you'll get a lot out of it, and you know, if you want more, feel, feel free to reach out to us. But again, just from the statistics, it's just reinforcing what's going on in general, uh, and this is just across the board. I know some of you said it's it's getting easier, which is wonderful. Some of you are saying, the majority of you are saying it's it's getting harder, and, and the statistics just show that. Um, but there's a decline on all fronts, right? A decline on the donor acquisition, there's a decline on donor re retention, there's a, de a decline on engagement. And uh, we'll talk a lot about that today. Chris McKenzie, do you wanna share anything else on that front? Sure, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the fact is, I don't wanna sound, sound too doom and gloom, but the fact is nonprofits, I mean, we've they've benefited from just unprecedented growth, David and, and Mackenzie, for, I mean, over the last 10 years. But then as of 2023, 2024, major donors are declining. They're donating almost 10% less overall in 2023. Uh, retentions decreased, right, uh, across all donor categories in 2023, uh, falling almost 20%. And then new donor counts, which is we're talking about acquisition here, right, have also fell by just under 20%. And they gave 34% less in 2023. So we, you need to address donor acquisition and retention. It's just imperative for all nonprofits. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I know that it's it's challenging, but I think that the good news is that we're all kind of in this together, right? It's a trend that we're seeing across the board and there are solutions to really help your nonprofit kind of overcome those challenges too, which I'm excited for us to talk through today. <laughs> All right, uh, donor acquisition. So that's we, we're going to talk a lot about that today. Um, the it's really all about identifying and engaging uh, with new potential donors, right, to grow your donor base, uh, but not only just to, to sustain, you know, your daily operations, but really to to uh, expand the impact your organization has, right? I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Uh, I mean, there's David. There's statistics here that are, you know, that 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 back this up, right? That 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 acquisition is is imperative, right? Um, I mean, you're right, Chris. I mean, it's not surprising, but 53% of all nonprofits in the U.S. are saying that the donor acquisition is their number one of their organization's top three fundraising challenges. So we all know there's an increased competition for donor attention. I mean, it just speaks volumes of what's going on in the industry. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and there's, there's increased competition for your donor's attention from these organizations. They're all getting all the, a lot of nonprofits getting more sophisticated in their outreach. Uh, and, you know, there are changing demographics. There, there's, there's fewer donations to go around, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, there, are, there are larger gifts coming in um, from fewer people, but that means you have to be more targeted. You have to understand what your donor's capacity and, and, and affinity towards your organization is. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but it, it is it's 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 really key to to all nonprofits long term success to 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 address this. And like Megan, uh, Mackenzie just said, it's it's really it's a solvable issue. And that's what we'll we'll talk about here. So let's get started and just talk about some of the reasons why this is happening. Right. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, economic conditions are, are an issue. I mean, it, there's an interesting f fact just to talk about the, the economic uncertainty. Uh, total charitable giving ha has fallen only three times in the last 40 years in, in current dollars. And that was in 87, 2008, and 2009. And those are all times of economic uncertainty. So I I, I know there's some debate about whether we are in, in, in economic uncertain times, but I think uh, the donors are behaving that way and that's what really matters so the reality is you know we are seeing a decline in donations and, and new donors and unfortunately this means doing more with less for a lot of organizations out there and they need to be as efficient as a possible in these times and, and have a it, it really i think we could we'll, we'll talk a little bit how we can solve those issues yeah and i think there's so many other factors chris right i mean in mckenzie the the, the demographics people were because of COVID and, and it wasn't mm -hmm. just a trickle effect, it's still moving on. 
uh, people are moving away from their original communities. They're leaving and joining new communities. I mean, uh, you know, even with that, how, how do these nonprofits attract those type of donors? Where are they coming from? How do they locate them? What do they do for the ones that have left? I mean, how do they offset that of people moving in? I mean, there's a lot of different changing conditions. And then, you know, when you're really thinking about that outreach, about the reasons why nonprofits are struggling with the donor acquisition and acquiring them, it, it, it also resonates with other factors. Like, how are you communicating and personalizing communications and, and campaigns to the individuals that whether they're existing, whether they're existing, whether they're new, whether they came to an event, how are you communicating with them? Are you communicating in a, the most efficient way? Are, are you resonating with a truly a consistent message with the right audience? And when we and you'll hear a lot about that today, right? It's not. I, I really believe it's not one size fits all anymore. It's not your organization and sending one email marketing campaign. But, you know, we'll talk about segmenting and talk about better ways of communicating, uh, talking about the effectiveness when donations are coming in or matching gifts are coming in and how that really resonates and is impacting. And how do you tell those stories better? Right. How do you tell those stories differently? How do you communicate those stories? And then you got to make it easy for yourself. And, you know, you know, one of the challenges is technology. I mean, you've got to make technology easy for you. And I, and, and we talk about this and we hear a lot about it and there's a lot of great software out there. You know, I mean, one thing you'll hear is nothing negative about any software, but the problem is they're all, a lot of them are siloed. So when they're siloed applications and they're siloed databases, and you've got to move that data into one platform, into your donor relationship management platform, is that helping you be efficient? Is it allowing you to give that best practice capabilities by responding on, a, on, a, on an efficient way? You know, are you having the uh, abilities to really capture and analyze the data and segment those data donors to really provide you in a smooth, easy, easy way to communicate with them and the right audience in a different way? I mean, there's just, there's a lot of different factors. It's not one major factor. I think it's a lot of different factors. And, you know, we'll talk about each one of those. Yeah. And just if I could add to David, I think, you know, this idea of making sure that we're, we're super targeted with donors and looking at your data kind of in that holistic way, I think it's really powerful because what that's going to enable you to do is communicate with donors and offer them opportunities that would be of personal interest, right? So helping donors get involved in ways that make the most sense for them is ultimately going to aid that acquisition. And really build the foundation for you to have a strong relationship. I know we're talking a lot about acquisition, but we mentioned retention being an issue too. So if you can get that donor initially involved in a way that's like very personally meaningful for them, you're going to be able to grow that relationship over time and, and really strengthen it too. So acquiring them in the right way, I think can be really influential. Yes. Yeah, that personalized touch, Mackenzie, is a great, great thought. Yes. Awesome. So, David, just to interject, there was a question that came in um, from Charlotte, and she wants to know what is the best all-encompassing software for some of those challenges that you listed? Well, I'm going to be a little biased, <laughs> um, you know, from my perspective. And I really think when you analyze software, you you really do look for what I would consider what it, what it, what an all-in-one is. And I, and I know, and I'm happy about it because a lot of vendors out there are doing that. And I think a lot of vendors are really striving to do a good job at that too. But I do believe there's only one company out there that is truly the only all-in-one as far as a fundraising, a donor relationship management, a healthcare hospitality and auction software as an all-in-one with one unified database that's fully integrated and automated. And I don't, I, I think there's other vendors that are out there that are doing it similar but I don't think they have all of these applications that would include grant management and campaign management and text-based donations and peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and team fundraising. And as you're growing and as you're trying to acquire more, you want to even be more efficient. And it's like they said earlier, you know, there was a lot of new and now, you know, it's been 10 years and you're accumulating more and how do you continue growing that, right? So I, I think there's a lot of different ways. I, I would just say from my perspective and I, I analyze the market, is Ariva. Ariva is providing that all-in-one online fundraising and donor relationship management and healthcare hospitality for organizations like the Ronald McDonald houses and, and things of that sort, or hospitality organizations that are providing, because it's a combination even on that front of managing and administrating the people that are visiting you, 
all the way through the fundraising efforts and managing and segmenting out and tracking things by household. So I appreciate that question. And um, that would be my answer today. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I can dive into a little bit here. I know that we've kind of spent a lot of time laying out the challenge of donor acquisition, and I know it can feel, you know, really difficult to reach new donor audiences or convert those potential supporters into the active contributors. And so, you know, we recognize those challenges, but we want to kind of help you overcome those, right? And so you might be wondering what are some strategies that can help you acquire these new supporters? And so we have really two here that we've mentioned we want to focus on today. As kind of my area of expertise here, I do want to acknowledge that promoting matching gifts can be a really great way to increase that acquisition rate and pull donors into your cause. Um, you might be wondering why or how, though. And so I have some numbers on the screen here that kind of help that. And so we know that matching gift communications can increase conversion because when donors know that whatever they contribute, their own impact could be amplified without them necessarily having to dig deeper into their pocket that's really going to encourage them to get involved. Um, I always like to say that matching gift communications can kind of stick out in this crowded communication landscape, right? I think donors oftentimes hear the same appeals, like donate now, give today, um, make a donation, right? But if you can accompany that appeal with a little bit of a matching gift component too, that can actually help your appeal oftentimes become more effective um, and more likely to be kind of seen or heard. The proof is really in those numbers. So we know that 84% of donors are more likely to donate if their gifts are matched. 71% um, more donors respond to fundraising appeals mentioning matching. Again, I think that that just helps you um, kind of think about that responsiveness piece. That matching gift appeal is super differentiated. It's likely to stick out. It's something that your donors are going to want to know to want to learn more about. Um, and then we also know that a 51% increase in donation amount results from mentioning matching. I think donors are just obviously kind of inspired by the thought of their gift growing. So they're encouraged to give more than they might have originally. So definitely some elements of donor psychology at play there. Um, and that kind of shows you the matching gift opportunity of what you can do to or the results that you can see from incorporating matching gifts. But of course, the other thing that we've touched on throughout is just personalized touch points in general. Um, I think personalization is the ultimate acquisition tool. Like we said, you know, that communication landscape is crowded. Donors get a lot of kind of generic mass messaging, but when that communication feels like it was crafted with them in mind, it feels like you understand who they are, kind of how they might want to give, that's going to become you know, more relevant to them and their responsiveness is really going to increase. And so I think personalization also is kind of this really great way to capture that attention, improve your outcomes and really build this sense of trust with the donor and enhance their overall experience. So if you can, we'll talk through some strategies today, but I think, you know, incorporating those matching gift elements and that personalization piece are two really great ways to help with that acquisition. And Mackenzie, I do have one question. This comes from Christopher. He wants to know how many markets may exist for matching fund and asset acquisitions. Yeah. And I think, you know, great question. As I'm thinking about from my perspective, kind of corporate matching gifts in general, um, the great news is that, you know, 65% uh, of Fortune 500 companies offer matching gift programs. So that's a huge number in and of itself. We know that over 26 million individuals qualify for corporate matching gifts, which obviously means that likely some donors that you already have or could reach um, are eligible. So there's really just this huge matching gift opportunity out there um, for you to really harness at your organization. Of course, besides corporate matching gifts, there are other ways that you can incorporate matching into your fundraising strategy as well. So through major donors, et cetera. So I think that there really are a lot of opportunities to, you know, incorporate that matching gift into your fundraising efforts and use that as a way to acquire these donors. So definitely a lot of opportunity out there. So let's start with some ideas, strategies, increasing donor acquisition through personal touch points and matching gifts. And I think we have a great, great few ideas on this stuff. And uh, we'll, we'll get started on how to identify and reach and acquire new donors and with target marketing campaigns. Um, I know, Chris, you, you've had a lot of experience on doing the research and and things. Maybe you could really touch on the, the, the analysis, the segmentation and, and things of that. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I also want to just make a real quick comment because uh, Beth in the chat mentioned, asked, you know, having great, her comment was having great tech is, is nice, but it takes a lot of time and money to, to really, um, you know, acquire new donors. And, and I, 
I don't I don't disagree, but I don't think it has to be super expensive. I think you have to work on efficiency to become more efficient in, in what you're doing. And I know that sometimes small organizations do, are, are already struggling with, with all the things that they're doing. Um, but really, I, I do think there there is uh, ways of doing what we're talking about that aren't onerous uh, either b because of the time involved or or the money involved. So I'll talk a little bit about some of these things. And and as David mentioned, these are these are items that you know have been working with nonprofits for over 25 years now. So some of this is is ex experience, but some of this is is data driven as well. And you know the, the struggles that I am seeing in on the client success side with our clients are. Number one, just identifying your donors and who and, and who they are and what's their what's their capacity to give and their and their propensity and affinity to give and how do you know that um, and and then knowing your donors overall and then and then scaling that ability internally uh, to to be able to make those connections with your donors uh, and, and with the resources that you do have and, and then. For those donors, you do have nurturing th those relationships and and maximizing those contributions, right? Is what it's all about, and that's that's all these bullet points that that we're talking about. You know, so how do you know your donors besides the the data that you do have, uh, and the data that you do have is incredibly val valuable, and you have to you have to make sure that that is quality data that you're keeping track of. Too often, one of the biggest issues I see with our clients is that their data, that the quality of the data entry is is inconsistent, and it. it the data that they're using to to identify prospects is is not is either missing, or uh, it's not consistent and it's unreliable. So so that get it. <laughs> if I can say one thing today, it's it's create a it's it's to create a procedures manual of how the data goes into your system and how to get it out too, because that is a big issue for a lot of our clients. All right, but in general, you can supplement the data that you do have with external data sources, uh, such as prospect research firms out there. We partner with two companies that will supplement the data that you have on your prospects and your donors with other data, including analysis on what their what their capacity to give is and, and what their propensity and affinity is with your organization. That's incredibly important, you know, because you could have someone that's giving you 20 bucks a year and then they're able to give you Twenty thousand dollars, right? And you're leaving money on the table, and that's really key to being. That goes back to that, that efficiency piece. You know, don't spend a lot of time trying to get a, a bunch of little donations from people that from some, when some people can give you a lot more. And and how do you know that other than through prospect research, right? And then data analysis and segmentation. You know, se segmenting prospective donors based on key criteria, so you can be more targeted in your outreach, which David and I and Mackenzie will talk about too. Uh, and, and really trying to speak to those donors. You know, anytime you segment supporters or, or, or potential supporters, it opens that door for that deeper personalization, increased emotional connections. When you're, you know, when you're speaking to a specific group rather than the entire audience, you know, your, your, your tailored message is more likely to resonate and get that donation ultimately is what it comes down to, right? Um, so, like certain, so, so what are some seg segments to consider? Uh, What's their capacity for major gifts? I was just talking about that. Uh, do they have relationships with other donors or staff members or board members? Do they have an affinity for your cause? How do you even know? Are you tracking the information to understand that? Um, there are other philanthropic indicators like uh, they have. There's board membership and and volunteer history that you can get through these prospect research firms as well. Um, and then you know, go, getting back to that that messaging, you know, creating compelling targeted marketing campaigns that resonate with the right audience, right? Do you send a generic, you know, ask to all your prospects, or do you tailor your messaging to their interests and their capacity? Um, I mean, that's really, really important. So, I don't know if uh, Mackenzie, David, do you have anything else to talk about here? Well, you know, from from I, I think building on that and and really identifying that that's really where, where it gets to knowing your audience. I mean, you know, the, there's a big gap of your donors. It could be, you know, young donors. It could be family members that are now becoming donors. It could be students that you've been educating on. I mean, it, it could be um, across the board, any type of donor. And I think, Chris, to your point, when you're doing the state analysis and you're really doing the segmentation and understanding what groupings there are, this is where it can start creating a truly compelling marketing campaign that's more personalized, and that's going to resonate with the audience. I mean, and it could be whatever that audience is, but you've got to understand that from having that ability to, um, you know, segmenting 
segmenting that data. And then once you're really building out these campaigns, these campaigns don't necessarily have to go to the same places. I mean, certain campaigns may go to certain social media outlets, right? Meaning it could go to LinkedIn, it could go to TikTok, it could go to you know Instagram. I mean, there's so many that are out there, but if you really do understand your audience and you know where they're residing, you really want to have you know them to really identify uh, this is just another way of really understanding what are the different marketing channels, what are the different platforms. Um, and, and that's not necessarily just social media. Some of your audience may just be an email marketing campaign that would be coming, you know, maybe it's an automated email marketing campaign. Maybe it's not, maybe you don't have that. You know, maybe it's just a constant contact, but you're resonating and you can segment those people, whoever they are on that list and write a nice email out to them. But you know, that's where that channel starts going on. And then, you know, Mackenzie, I know you had some really great points about the different types of campaigns for fundraising gifts. Yeah, definitely. And I, I agree with everything that's been said so far. You know, I think knowing your donors is important and then using that knowledge to craft really targeted campaigns is going to obviously increase your conversion and, and get you that efficiency. I think within those targeted campaigns that you create, of course, you can also use some matching gift touch points or mentions, I think, to increase that success even further. Um, we talked about this a little bit before, but obviously supporters are going to listen to those matching gift appeals. And so whenever you can leverage that, I think that you'll see a lot of success. Um, I think as you incorporate matching gifts into those campaigns, there are a few things that I want to call out to keep in mind. Um, and this was kind of mentioned in the chat before, but remember that donors are oftentimes just unaware whether or not their company has something like this in place, right? They're not sure whether or not they would qualify. And so if within those digital marketing channels, like maybe on LinkedIn, right, you want to kind of take the lead here and promote matching gifts proactively, you can kind of drive that awareness and move donors along that journey um, because they're going to want to get involved with your organization. They realize the impact their gift could have. Um, they want to take advantage of that employer program too. And so that's really just going to get them really excited and empowered to get involved I think fortunately incorporating this into any of those campaigns that you're creating um, is a relatively low lift. It can really be simple messaging such as, did you know many employers match their employees' charitable contributions? See if your impact could be doubled, right? Again, really simple messaging, but that's going to kind of create this sense of urgency, pique the interest of your audience and encourages them to go ahead and, and kind of learn about the programs and get involved with your cause if they you know, discover that they qualify. Um, you can see here that I mentioned, it's really important to kind of provide education too. So just remember, like I, I said before, that a lot of times your donors need help determining if they qualify. So if you're going to be promoting matching gifts, just be prepared to answer some common questions that they might have, such as if their company has a program, what the typical request process might be, um, what some common deadlines are, um, how matching gift benefits them, right? Like basic um, answers like that, I think is going to be really powerful. And if you can provide that information to your donors, that's going to be most effective at, at really aiding that acquisition. <laughs> Mackenzie, I just want to throw one thing. I, I love the fact because I think there was a question in here is I wish, you know, companies would tell their employees about matching gifts. And I, 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 I think that's a really wonderful thing. But the way that you just said it is doing that indirectly, because if you're sharing that and some people don't even realize when they're giving a donation that they can actually do a matching gift with their company. So I mm -hmm. think as that simple messaging Maybe when you're sending that out as a donation, hey, please check if your company gives a matching gift, just will resonate very, very well. And the ones that I've seen have done it, they have been somewhat, I won't say 100% successful, but they are reaching back and then they're outputting in. You also have to make, make sure that your system allows in the online side that you can accept matching gifts, whether it's whether you, you've integrated with the double donations or even if you haven't, that they have that capability at a minimum, even to put that name in so you could do it manually. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's a lot easier when you do integration with the double donations and it comes up and does that for you, but you've got to have that readily available online and making everything user donor centric in my, in, in my perspective mm -hmm. as well. So I think that combination yeah. plays very, very well, Mackenzie. 
Yeah, definitely. And I agree. It would be great if companies did provide more education to their employees about it. But if as a nonprofit, you can kind of sit in the driver's seat, you're going to reap a lot of the benefits because you kind of are at that targeted point to help donors through the matching gift process, right? They're going to have that double impact on your cause. And so I think they're going to like that messaging coming from you too, and they'll kind of listen and get involved. Um, and I 100% agree with your point too, David, about making sure that you have a means to kind of you know, make sure donors are submitting those matching gifts and, and kind of tracking them along the way. And I think we'll get to this later, but you're kind of hinting a little bit of, about making sure that you know where your donors work, right? We have on here that you should um, do data analysis, know things about your donors, their, their traits, one of those being where they work so that you can help them uncover that eligibility, which I know we'll get into later, but I definitely agree, David. All right. Um... These are great, great conversations. Uh, okay, so uh, knowing and understanding your donors, we, we already touched on this quite a bit already, just through uh, you know, it's an organic conversation we're having, which is great. And and this goes back to what I was saying earlier about having you know quality data. You have to you have to know and understand your donors and have information on them. And I I talk to a lot of executive directors and development directors, and and they they have an incredible amount of information about their donors and prospects in their head. Uh, and but it's it's institutional memory. It's not documented. And you know, having a, a, a system in place that allows you to to take that information that's sitting in people's heads and put them into a database that you can then use to segment those prospects and those those donors is is key. So get that get that information out of your head and get it get it into your solution, so you can then start doing your donor segmentation and tailoring those communications and and creating those meaningful relationships. Uh, and and provide thoughtful and, and effective stewardship is what it's all about, you know. But there's also other ways to to how do you get that information to understand who they are besides some of those things I talked about earlier, like using prospect research. Well, you you could survey and get feedback from your own donors, right? Um, and and understand better what how are they affiliated with your organization? What are their interests? Do, do they like a certain program you're running? Are they volunteering for you? And do you have a solution in place that's tracking all that where you can see all that information and use it to segment your donors all in one place? That, that, is, that is key. Um, and then being able to analyze the data, trends, patterns, seeing that information, gaining those insights and making those data-driven decisions with, with that data is, is also very important, having the reporting capacity to, to, and, to, and to be able to use the, that data analysis to segment and, and send out those communications is key. Donor stewardship and relationship building. Can, do you know I, that there's, there's a lot of information too and linkages between your board and your staff and prospects and donors that you should be tracking as well. Does your, does your tech allow you to track those relationships between all those different groups? Um, so that you you can uncover and unearth prospects you didn't even know existed and, and actually use those connections and those relationships to, to make those asks from people. That, that's, that's also huge. Um, I don't know, David McKenzie, do you have anything else to, to add to that? If I could, I was just going to add on to what I was talking about a little bit before with that employment information. So Chris, you did a, a lot here of talking about, you know, analyzing your donor data to gain those insights. And I, I want to just kind of mention that you might have donor employment information on hand, or if you don't already, it's something that you can pretty easily collect. Um, and that can be really valuable to you as well. I often get the questions of, you know, how often should you ask for employment information? And I think, you know, we know employment information can go out of date quickly. Mm -hmm. So I think asking your donors kind of early and often it is really important. Um, you know, I think that that employment information, of course, can then aid you in a lot of ways. Um, you know, we talked about matching gifts and helping donors kind of uncover their eligibility and take their matching gift next steps through their company. So that's one way that that information can benefit you. Um, if you're thinking of other use cases as well, I think having employment information on hand can sometimes, you know, help you hint at some wealth data. You know, um, employment information might not be enough to, to uncover maybe a major donor, but it can certainly be a starting point, right? And it can help you get to know these donors on a deeper level and perhaps hint at their kind of capacity to give. Um, so those are just two common use cases that you might see there. But I think that the point being that this is another really great, sometimes overlooked piece of information that can help you get to know your donors better and communicate with them better and then target audiences like them um, that you think might be interested in supporting your cause in the future. So I just wanted to kind of call out that as a, another example of the type of information you could be looking for to help your, your acquisition and you know even retention efforts down the road. 
We did, I want to interject one question. We did get a question about donor surveys. Can you speak a little bit more about donor surveys and the kinds of questions you should be asking on them? Yeah, well, I think, I, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, David. go ahead, Chris. No, no, please go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I have seen examples. I, I will have to go back and maybe we can provide some afterwards, um, some samples to, to people uh, when we send out information. But I, I, I would have to go back and look at them up. But David, if you have if you have any more information, please go. You no, know, I I think finding some examples would be would be great. But I I think the the when you're doing a donor survey, you know, and you're thinking about the audience, what what do you really want to know for them, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I don't just mean that you want money from them, but what do you want to learn from them, you know? And if you can really think about the things that you would like to learn from your existing donors, you know, what are their interests? You know, you know, and I could give you a few different examples, but what are their what are their interests? You know, and and it could be as opposed to just an open ended question. It could be a box that's open ended. It could be some different items. You know, do you have interest in you know participating in events? Do you have interest in our newsletters? Do you have interest in, um, um, you know, in in learning more about the organization? Would you like to see a tour of our organization? I mean, these are just some examples of questions on the survey that you would want. Do you like getting a, a, a do you like getting emails? Do you like getting texts? Do you like mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of this stuff already going on online, right? Because of that whole GDPR ruling and, and they don't want to mm -hmm. inundate you. So you've got to opt it in. But if you're sending these type of surveys out and getting this type of feedback and really learning from that, even in that case, you can go identify the people that did respond on the survey and start even doing a little bit more preferencing on them. Don't send them email, send them tax, maybe put a task in there. I mean, it could be as granular as that, but when you're getting this type of feedback, you know, do you like our impact studies? Uh, there's just so many other things that you could do and we could have a separate meeting on this, but just think about the things that you're doing today. Things about, think about the things that you're not doing today that you're thinking about doing and get that feedback. Is it of interest to them? Because you know, a lot, a lot sometimes that we do, it could be just feel good. And we talk about this a lot. So we do a lot of things and then we'll do a survey. And then we find that what made us really feel good, maybe the results weren't as good as what we thought. And then, you know, if you're really, and we'll talk a little bit more about analyzing and tracking, but these are just really important things that you want to get out of this. It's not just a survey that you're just getting. It's a survey that you're really going to analyze and then you're going to do something with it, right? It's going to have to have it's going to have some level of impact to your organization. But, you know, even when you do that, you know, it, it, it goes back to, which we'll now talk about, you mm -hmm. know, the communicating part. How do you communicate mm -hmm. with this? You know, I, I mean, you really, you know, what does it really mean to communicate your story with impact? I mean, that's how you have to look at it. You have to share what's compelling differentiator because there's so many nonprofits all within a, very local radius. And, and we know that you're competing with so many different people. Uh, you're competing with, you know, so many wonderful organizations. Um, you know, everybody wants to get with everybody. I mean, that just, so why should a donor, and, and this is what you need to think about, why does a donor want to choose you to support your cause? What, 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 what is it that I would want to go, or maybe I'm giving somebody else. And I know a lot of changes have been made where people aren't, maybe they're giving the same amount of a dollar, but now they're distributing that dollar to multiple people. So how do you get a piece of that? And why would they want to do that? And then how will your donation at any level, right, have an impact, right? Because we talk about impact reports, right? And I've seen some wonderful, wonderful things that if you want to see the impact, click here and it takes them back to their website. Um, you know, one of those examples, and I think it's still up, and I, I truly loved it, was a Boys and Girls Club of Salt Lake City uh, Gabby, I don't know if you have the link and if you could post the link just so everybody that would go directly to that impact, but it showed the levels. And, and this was, by the way, this was just one way, right? There's so many different ways of doing this, right? There's videos, there's infographics, there's te testimonials, there's case studies. But when you could do a very one pager and, and showing, you know, how many meals we, or how many programs I supported or how many people I actually trained internally or whatever that would be it's so meaningful, you know, and, and, and at the same time, you know, you're, you're doing storytelling. I mean, we talk about storytelling all the time. I, I hear everybody, I get, I get marketing, uh, Hey, we can help you with better storytelling, but you're living the story. You're living the results of what you're doing. 
you're providing these wonderful programs, you're helping children, you're helping adults, whatever your organization is, animals, it could be so many different things, but you know, convey that message and then convey the impact that those donors, those volunteers, those board members are really having on that and how that is actually changing. And you want to share those personal stories, as we say it, and highlight the challenges that you face. Don't be a Afraid, I mean, to tell, hey, my God, this is happening right now. I mean, and a piece of that, talk about the journey and then make sure you talk about those positive outcomes because I want to feel good even for, even if I gave $10 or I gave 100,000 or I gave 100,000, you know, it doesn't matter the level, you have to really share that and make it easy. I mean, that's what we talk about when we're talking about visual content. You, you've got to have, where well, you can do a video on this and, and maybe you're, you're, you know, I've seen so many wonderful different videos, but showcasing the organization um, and, and then those just as some of the things, you know, from, from, from the communication side of this. Yeah. And if I could add on to, I know that we have that call out at the bottom here, but something that we've talked about throughout as we're talking about, like if you're looking to incorporate matching gifts into that outreach that you have as well, it might sometimes seem abstract for a donor, kind of what that matching gift impact is. So I think making sure that as you're thinking about storytelling and showing donors the impact that they can have on your mission, being sure to kind of tell the outcomes made possible by these matching gift programs too, is another really great way to encourage donors to get involved um, with their program and you know, really participate in it as well. So I think that the value of storytelling, you know, is really important. If you're asking a donor to volunteer, you want to use storytelling to show them what they can make possible. If you're asking them to give, if you're asking them to get their gift match, whatever it is, weaving storytelling into that is really going to kind of improve your success rates. So there's so many other ways. I mean, we talk about implementing and, and you hear about this and Sometimes it's confusing. I don't understand what multi-channel marketing strategy is and how do I make it easy to give in multiple ways, right? You know, I, 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 I think, you know, the point here, first of all, is when you look at statistics and 61% of, of donors worldwide prefer to giving online, you got to make your website what I would consider a donor, donor-centric website. It's got to be user-friendly. It's got to be easy to communicate. The One of the most important things that I've seen is when you can keep them on your website, um, you will see site engagement go up. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, whether they're giving a donation, whether they're registering for an event, whether they're registering for um, you know, an online pledge, whether they're creating a pledge, whether they're paying a pledge, um, whether they're participating in a team fundraising or peer-to-peer -peer, you know, uh, raise through their friends, it, for me, when you are, have them captured on your website and they're filling out this information, they click submit, you want them to be able to stay on your website. I, I really think this is one of the most important things and go check your website today. If they're being pushed off because your donation vendor or your event vendor or your campaign vendor is taking them off the website and marketing their site, you don't want that. You want them and there's multiple ways of doing this, but you will see site engagement go up and then what do you want them to do when they're on your website? So you need that flexibility. Do they stay on that page? Do you redirect them? Um, but you want to make sure that they want to stay on that page. So making this a donor-centric and making it user-friendly, I think, is just a very important thing. Whether you redirect them to the impact, if it was a donation and how their donations mm -hmm. are, or an event and how that event helped previous years. I mean, there's just so many different ways. And then you do want, you know, you do want to give many different ways, your, your donors, your active volunteers, your board members, um, different ways of even promoting um, and giving, right? So there's just so many different ways, whether it's an unlimited donation page, meaning if you could just think about it this way, and I think Gabby has a good example of an un unlimited donation page, but if you think about ways to give and somebody clicks on it, they've got to click on it and go to it. But if you were doing it and segmenting out and, and saying, hey, please give it a different way and it's all on one page and it's easy, I've seen so many different ways of doing this uh, without having to be a development shop. I, you know, I saw somebody wear a small shop. Well, this should be done for a small shop or a medium shop. It doesn't matter. And then providing a peer-to-peer -peer giving. I mean, it's another way, peer-to-peer, -peer, and we'll talk about it a little bit more, but it's just another way through awareness and donor, donor, donor acquisition. I mean, it's just pretty amazing. And then you always want to have, which I will always call a clear call to action. I, I think it's really important on doing this. And in fact, Gabby, I think you had one of the Ronald McDonald houses of New Mexico as a good yep. example. 
right? Did you, she just I put it in the you... chat. Yeah, oh, I good. put it in the chat, David. Thanks. Yep. I, I just wasn't looking at the chat. I'll distract my talking. So, mm -hmm. um, but it, but anyways, you know, having something very very visually appealing, you know, whether it's a donation mm -hmm. page, with whether it's a vent page, whether it's how it's linking to your website, whether it's an email campaign that you're sending out and trying to get them back. Uh, however that is, make it easy for the donor to find a donation button. I mean, I was on with a, a, a vendor actually, and they said, David, we have so many clients in the faith-based side. And when you go to the faith-based side, I can't find the donation. And it was really difficult. And as simple as you may think that, it wasn't easy. So you, you've got to make it very simple and very intuitive on your website for all types of pages. And um, just have a good clear, to, clear call to action on that stuff. Yeah, that, that, that link that Gabby put in the chat is a great example of tying the impact to the donation, right? That's having a solution to throw online giving that it gives you that flexibility to create pages like that, that, that really, you know, tie the amount they're giving to the impact that it's having. It's, that's a great example. Thanks for sharing, Gabby. All right. And I can jump in here for this one. I think kind of in that theme of making it easy for donors, obviously, if you're going to be promoting matching gifts and trying to use it kind of as that fundraising magnet, you also want to make it really easy for the donor to get involved. And so really to create the best donor experience, you're going to want to integrate matching gifts into that donation flow. So it's super simple. Uh, there are really two things that you can do to do this. The first of which being just collect employment information during the donation process. So just add a field to your donation form that asks donors to enter that information. The key here, though, is to make sure that you provide a little bit of context why you're asking, right? So rather than just naming the field something like employer or company, I think if you can expand the way you name that field to get the donor excited um, while they're giving, that's going to be the best case scenario. So you could say something like enter your employer name to see if your donation could be doubled or double or triple your gift, enter the name of your business to search for a matching gift, right? That little bit of context can go a really long way and can help you really make sure that donors finish that donation process while they're on your form because they're going to want to see if they qualify and see if they could have that double impact. From there, I think the next best practice when it comes to integrating matching into that donation flow is just to provide some sort of next steps or messaging on your confirmation page. So once that donor has submitted that gift, they're now kind of in that place to request a match from their employer. You want to make it easy for them to understand how to do so. If you can provide the donor really personalized next steps based on kind of that employment information they did enter on the form, that's the best donor experience. But I know that that might not be possible for every organization. So even if you just include a line on your confirmation page, like contact your HR department to learn more, or you list a few companies with matching gift programs and what that typical request process could look like, that's another really great step forward, right? That's really maintaining the giving momentum and giving donors kind of this idea of how to access their next steps and take advantage of that program. So I know that these are fairly simple suggestions, but I think the impact of just including matching in some way in that process can be powerful in yes, donor acquisition, which we're talking about, but then kind of maintaining that engagement with the donor as well, that's going to lead to that long-term retention for you um, as they get involved with your organization in multiple ways. Thanks for sharing. Go ahead, oh, Gabby. Sorry, no, I just want to interject some questions that are coming in around matching mm -hmm. gifts. Um, some people have been mentioning that it does take some time to process donations uh, from other from you know corporate matching gifts. But what is the average timeline for when a nonprofit will receive their matching gift? Is there one? That's a really good question. And unfortunately, it is so dependent on company to company because every company has their own um, process in place for how they're distributing those funds and they have their own deadlines for when employees need to request that match. Right. But I think if you're looking to kind of stay in the know and you want to have an idea of when to expect to receive those funds, really the best case scenario is to stay in contact with the donor. Right. So if you're providing donors next steps or you're sending matching gift follow up emails, you want to kind of have a way to track if donors have, you know, gone to that matching gift form or have a way for the donor to let you know, hey, I submitted that match because then you can know to be on the lookout for those funds specifically, right? So if you can have the donor report in some way, I've submitted a match, that's going to help you um, kind of stay on track and be on the lookout for those funds so that you can process them at your organization. And are you able to see a list of companies that match donations? Like let's say it was a smaller company. 
Yeah, that's a good question. Of course, I think, you know, companies oftentimes maybe on their website in their CSR reports, et cetera, will list information about their matching gift program. Um, at Double the Donation, we do have a database of like 24,000 companies that have matching gift programs, including some smaller companies and more regional companies, right? It's not just the big guys anymore. Um, but we have a lot of really great educational resources as well, even if you don't use our product that lists some of um, companies with those programs in place. Well, I think talking about, you know, there's so many different ideas and unfortunately we're always limited with time and we're running out of time. So I just want to, <laughs> I, we picked this, we picked a couple just to share it with you, but tribute gifts and memorial gifts. And, and I think it was really important because what we find is that 33% of donors worldwide give tribute gifts. And one of the problems in the industry when it comes to tribute gifts is that the time it takes for organizations to provide an acknowledgement to the honoree of the person that is receiving the tribute gift, which definitely has an impact, not only to the donor acquisition, but also on the donor engagement and retention. And the reason that is, is today, a lot of systems are set up where when they go in and they give a, a tribute gift, and I wanna say one other thing, there's an alignment. You've gotta remember there's an alignment, right? If I'm giving a tribute gift, regardless whether it's a, a, an honor of or in memory of, and I'm giving it to that person, there's an alignment of that person and the organization, or I would give it to somebody else. And, 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 and this is part of donor acquisition and a big part of donor acquisition, but it also plays very strongly into donor retention. And we have been traveling quite a bit and talking to many, many people, including board members. And I, I literally, three days ago, I left a board member and they were telling me, I, I always give a tribute gift to the people that I think would be aligned, whether they are part of this organization or not. And one of my biggest frustrations, and it is probably going to be the last time, I've given a number of tribute gifts and I am on the board. I don't get an acknowledgement that they acknowledge the person because when I fill out the information, I click submit, all of it goes to the organization. In some cases, David, it took them probably at a minimum three weeks, which still wasn't acceptable. The last one, it took them three months. I made three phone calls. I asked, oh, we're so sorry. We're going to get it out this week. I mean, because everybody is just so busy. You, you want to have that ability on your tribute where you can put in the person's name, put in their email address, write a comment, click submit. And that person that you're honoring is getting that acknowledgement instantaneously. The organization should know that. So the person that is giving that, that tribute gift feels good. The second thing is they should receive all the information, both from the person that's giving as well as who the person he gave it to. And then from a donor acquisition point, you can go and segment that person that received that tribute gift, see if they're in your donor database. If they're not, then you do an outreach and then you, at, you know, acknowledge the, the gift and then you ask if they would love to you know, uh, learn more. Could I put you on our newsletter? Could I send you an event? I mean, you've got to ask these questions. You can't assume them because when you do ask the questions and they say yes, they're more than likely to open your email. If you don't ask the question and you send it to them, they're more than likely to uh, opt out completely and don't want to receive anymore. But this is a really great way of receiving tribute gifts. It's a great way of, you know, people that are tied to your organization that are giving. And, and when you do know there's 33%, and I go back to the question, how do we let corporations know? Well, you need to let your donors know when you have this set up this way, that if you they gave a tribute, they're going to get an automatic acknowledgement through you directly. Feel free to send a comment. But I think these are just some of the really important ways. So that's one way of getting uh, an increase in donor acquisition. It's another way that you're letting technology work for you. At the same time, you've got to build some things. You've got to think about a tribute wall. You've got to recognize the people that are giving those tribute gifts. And, and not just individually. I think personal personalized certifications, you know, or cert certificates and mailing it to them and, and having that personalized, maybe a living memorial wall, you know, social media tributes, if it's appropriate where you can publicize that such and such just gave a tribute gift to this in honor of that person, we want to recognize that. I mean, when, when you're acknowledging people in so many different ways, and then just you have to express recognition and gratitude always. I mean, I can't emphasize it enough, whether it's and, and it has to go beyond just an automatic acknowledgement and thank you, which mm -hmm. hopefully your systems are set up that way, and then notifications to the individual and your staff, but take it a step further, you know, make that personal phone call. 
because people want that acknowledgement. I don't care who they are, whether they're giving a dollar donation, a $10 donation. And, and personally, I, I know it because I live it. And when somebody calls me after I even register for an event or I gave a donation or I gave a reoccurring donation and they call, I literally remember it. It's lasting. So, you know, make that difference. And that's why I think tribute gifts are so important because 33% are given. Chris McKenzie, any? Thing on tribute? Yeah, the majority of those are from new donors. It is. It's a great way to acquire donors and, and facilitating the ease of giving. The, I, I can't believe how many online donation forms I've seen that don't even have the ability to give, you know, a, a, an honor or memorial gift at all, and much less track the people who want to be notified on behalf of those memorials as well, which you should have, and, and also manage on the back end in, in your donor relationship management piece as well to easily create those a list for your tribute walls and to send out those notifications to people who want to be notified on behalf of those memorials. Absolutely. And then just another wonderful way is peer to peer fundraising. I, I, I talk to so many people and um, I, I think peer to peer fundraising can be used in so many different ways and, and it has to be integrated with your current platform. It can't be like a GoFundMe, which I think is a great product for an individual that needs something or wants to help a friend that's not affiliated with a, nonprofit, but you, if, if somebody is going to build a, a page and send this page out, you know, and, and explain why they're sending this out, you want it to be directly tied directly into your donor relationship management platform. Um, why? Because not only are you getting the money, you're also getting the information. You know, if you're only getting a check from a group of people and it's one check from one person, you're never going to get that building on that donor acquisition. So when uh, when somebody is building this page, they're sending it out to their friends. It's a great way. They can write what they want. They can explain what the, the donation is for. They can they can put a time frame around it. I mean, I know, Mackenzie, you, you mentioned that earlier about one of your examples of time frames, that sense of urgency of, of why I'm raising $30,000 or why I'm raising $300,000 or why I'm raising $3,000. The amount doesn't matter, but having a time frame around that, the reason why you're doing that, the messaging, it also, when they're giving a donation, you know, they can see a leaderboard. You can have a leaderboard. You can send out the right messaging. You should have the ability through peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, even to send this out through their own individual social media. So they're helping create more awareness. And anybody that clicks on it is going directly back to the organization, onto the page. The donation is being accepted everybody is receiving some sort of acknowledgement, meaning if the donor gives a donation towards McKenzie, McKenzie is going to get notified that that individual gave it. The organization is going to get notified. And, and, and the person that gave a donation is going to get an automatic thank you acknowledgement receipt. So it's three different levels. And then the organization, if they can segment out their donor database and say, because maybe you can't acknowledge them right that day, right? Maybe you got it, but you're busy or you're you're at a meeting or you're running an event, uh, but it should be easy to go into your donors and segment that out and say, I want to see everybody that gave any type of donation or registration or membership or whatever that was in the last seven days. And then you can you know, distribute that to your staff or yourself and then make those phone calls and acknowledge those people. But these are just some of the other ways of really, truly acquiring new donors. It's a fantastic way of doing yes. this, you know, yeah. and, and, and then you just want to, again, you, you, you know, you want to have, you know, the support is create, you're allowing them to create their own personality pages. I, I say it that way. You can create team challenges. You can have fundraising events and encourage supporters to host, you know, their own event, you know, even, even doing it virtually today, we've seen some wonderful things. And then, you know, if you want a certain message, you can write the message and let them know, hey, if you're sending this, e even in the pay to peer fundraising, they can write their message, but you could have a tab or should have a tab that puts your message in there too. So you can have pre-written posts. So anybody that's doing this is, is having the ability to see from both sides of this. Yeah, it really goes back to, you know, what I mentioned earlier where someone said, how do I, it, this takes time and money to acquire new donors. I mean, the, the beauty of peer-to-peer of -peer is it, it, it amplifies your fundrais fundraising efforts like beyond the list of donors and prospects that you're dealing with. And, you know, these new donors are coming through this network of, of donors who are fundraising on behalf of your organization, right? It allows your staff, your board member, your volunteers, et cetera, to ask for donations through this peer-to-peer -peer campaign. And sometimes those people may otherwise not want to directly ask for money on behalf of your organization, especially face-to-face. -face. So it's, it's, it's a great tool.
Yeah, I think that those peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers obviously can be a really quick way to reach a lot of new supporters. And I think as you're connecting all of those new supporters to your cause um, and you get them for the first time, you know, showing them new ways that they can get involved with your organization past that donation as well, finding ways to connect with these donors that you acquired through peer-to-peer -peer campaigns and keep them involved is a really great way to um, build out your success from them as well. But obviously those peer-to-peer -peer campaigns can just be a really huge boost to your acquisition efforts, I think, pretty immediately. For time, we'll just try to wrap this up. I, I, I just think here, expressing personalized gratitude, I can't emphasize it enough. I, I, I mean, you could give to three different organizations and the one that acknowledges you and, and really sets some sort of task up that they're reaching you every 90 days on a phone call, not necessarily really understanding what your gift was, but really personalizing things. And, um, and just to use, diff there's so many different ways. And again, I go back to, that segmentation that Chris and Mackenzie both mentioned about understanding that maybe they only want a text message. Maybe they want an email. Maybe they want to see something on social media. Um, but those are just really important things. The consistency of acknowledgement and any way that you can think about is probably one of the most important things on anything that you guys are doing today. Chris? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Uh, I mean, I, I I, <laughs> I've seen too many times, and, and really, you're, you're, the, the solutions you're using should should automate this, right? Anytime someone's giving online, that thank you should be going out automatically. That, that's exactly what our solution does, right? Uh, but even when you're manually entering donations on the back end in, the, in your donor relationship management piece, you've got a big stack of checks. You know, it's it's very, you should have a solution that allows you to have multiple letter templates and email templates that, that you can assign each gift as you're entering them so that you are personalizing and tailoring that thank you to not only uh, the size of the donation, donation, but also, um, you know, what what are they supporting and, and, and reinforcing that that thank you and that gratitude. Um, and then also, you know, when you do have people, let's say they're giving over 200 bucks, do you want to give a personal thank you? I think you should. And, and can your solution automate an, an, e an, an email with a report that goes to you every Monday saying, here's all the donors that have given 200 bucks or more. So you get that list in your inbox on a Monday and, and, and express that gratitude to them even more. Uh, you, you, having, again, going back to, back to that efficiency piece, you can do this. And I know it, it, you think it takes time and money, but with the right, right tech in place, solutions in place, it's, it makes it a lot easier. Yeah, and I think, you know, if I could just quickly jump in, I know we're close on time here, but I think when you express that gratitude um, and have really strong um, stewardship aspects like this, that can oftentimes aid you in donor acquisition too, because when a donor feels appreciated, they feel like you value them, they got this personalized piece of communication, they're more likely to share their experience um, with your organization and kind of what their donation meant with their network, which is obviously going to get you more exposure and can kind of have these multiplying effects. So I think that gratitude piece can't be overlooked. That's great, Mackenzie. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just really two slides. And then if you'd like to listen to who we are from both uh, Ariva, we'll talk a little bit about that and, and uh, donor, uh, double the donations. But just to wrap it all up, I just love to end this with a wonderful case study. This is an organization is called Pure GSD. And um, they literally were a grassroots organization. It was literally a 100% a a volunteer organization. They had a goal uh, to, to raise $8 million. I don't know how they came up with a number that would help um, cure a deficiency within glycosygen. Um, and they did everything. If you, you know, everything that we talked about today, they built their database, they segmented out, they knew who their audience was. Uh, they use all different sources. They were using peer-to-peer -peer fundraising for 18 year olds trying to raise money in New York where they were located here in Florida. Uh, you know, the wonderful news, and I always get goosebumps when I, you know, I talk about this, but, you know, their challenge was raising the $8 million. They did so many different types of events. They communicated the events. They communicated the impact when they were raising money. Uh, they, they came up with their own standard gift from the heart campaign and what that was. It was, and it was re-engaging 20 years worth of donors and volunteers, uh, and they did an amazing job. And, and the end results of everything that they've done and still doing, and now they're, and the reason I say I got goosebumps is they literally, as part of doing this, and you know, we were just the technology behind it, and and they built two different websites. You know, their first website was a pure fundraising to get this moving. Now it's still fundraising website, donor centric website, but very more informational. They actually achieved one of their first goals, which was um, 
for finding a cure for type one, their first type on uh, type one deficiency with glycosygen. And it's just a really wonderful thing. Uh, but it's nice when you find different case studies that people are really using all the things that we're talking about. And there was a lot more, but if you'd like to learn more, let us know. And then the, the last slide is if you'd like to fundraising, Gabby, I, you want to yeah, so if there's anything that you saw here today, um, there were some questions about software, uh, different applications, donation pages, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, ports, uh, email communications, anything that we covered today that you'd like to learn more about, please let us know. Um, I'll keep this poll up and then I'll let David walk through a little bit about uh, what we do here at Ariva. If you wanna keep going through David, I'll glance for this. Yeah, you know, I'll just share this with you. I I, I know what, it was literally 74% have two or more applications. And I think those in its own right are, are, are challenging to many organizations and moving data around. And if you're moving data around, whether you're moving from, you know, one, uh, uh, you know, uh, an event platform, a donation platform, or any other type of platform, a text-based platform, that's really the point is, you know, that is creating some inefficiencies. And, and really what you're looking for, and I know somebody asked what platform does that, you really are looking for one unified database that has all the different applications. And you wanna make sure also that all these applications, you don't have to buy everything, right? I just wanna share with you, Ariva has been around for 30 years. We have over 6,000 clients. We, through these 6,000 clients, through different applications, our clients have done over 30,000 in live and virtual and different hybrid events and golf events and gala events and all different types. Our software, and I'm really proud to say that it was exclusively built for the nonprofit industry. Not only do we have 6,000 clients, but we have been vetted and approved by many national organizations, uh, even though we have to work with each individual chapters, but it's really great when they vet it and process this. And like the Boys and Girls Clubs, the Jewish Federations, the Rotaries, the Society of St. Vincent of Paul's, uh, Meals on Wheels, and I, Ronald McDonald House Charities. In fact, I think over 80% of every Ronald McDonald House charity in the world is using some version of our product. I won't get into all the applications, but we really you know, in our own rights, we've developed quite a few different applications. So you're not having these silos of applications. We also have an incredible client success and services side of the organization. Um, everything is mobile responsive, but really what's important is the outcomes that our clients are seeing. You know, when we talked about donor acquisition today and our clients are literally seeing that are really focusing on this over 300% increase on their donor acquisitions. And because the way we've set this up, and they're not leaving their website, they're seeing over 215% increase in site engagement. And they're seeing a return on return on investment. I mean, there's just some wonderful things. And then there's just a lot of things. We say we're with our clients for good. And we have clients that have been with us for over 20 years. And we're very proud to say that. And then the last thing is if you'd like to learn more about double donations, we'd love to, you know, to let us know on that. And here was that survey. Perfect. And I can dive into a little bit um, quickly just to overview. So thank you for going through that. Um, Chris, I know we talked a lot about leveraging matching gifts today, but if you're looking for kind of efficient ways to do that, um, you know, our software can integrate directly with your Ariva Exceed Further solution. Um, that's going to allow you to really automatically identify which of your donors are eligible for matching gifts as they give. Um, so you can embed our database directly into your donation form. Donors will enter their employer name. We kind of compare that against our database. And then on the confirmation page, while donors are still in that giving mindset, you can automatically give them the information they need about their eligibility in their company's program, right? So you can guide them straight to that matching gift submission form, make it really one click for them to go ahead and, and request that match from their employer. From there, we have some automated um, email streams as well that are going to allow you to remind donors about that matching gift eligibility and really encourage them to take their next steps. Um, and then in the background, of course, we're helping you track how donors are engaging with your matching gift touch points and kind of progressing through that process as well, just so you have a little bit more insight um, and are able to know when to expect those funds. So really great solution to help you kind of make the most of matching gifts and harness that form of corporate giving. And I'll just say, I, I, first of all, I, I wanna thank uh, Mackenzie and, and I'm really proud to say that we are a fully integrated partner um, with double the donations, and it really works amazingly well. And the clients that are using it are seeing great success. Mackenzie, I want to thank you for joining us today on this panel. I, I, I know I got a lot out of it. I hope the audience got out of it. Chris, I, I'd like to thank you for all your contributions on this. And 
And special thanks to Gabby for putting it all together. Gabby, you're amazing. We appreciate that. But equally, thank you. I want to thank all of you that attended today. Uh, we wouldn't be here without you. And we can't thank you enough what you do each and every day uh, with your staff. And I think that's a really important and the acknowledgement you give to them. And equally as important what you're doing for the programs that you're harnessing, uh, how you're handling and working in, in the community at large and all the other wonderful things. I know there's a lot of challenges that you face each and every day. And if you ever need any help, regardless whether you have our product or not, feel free to reach any of us because that's what it's all about. We really believe in social good and we're really happy we're doing what we do today. Uh, Thank you for having us, David. We really appreciate it. And you know, I appreciated all of your insights today. <laughs> Chris? Thanks, everybody, for joining. Look forward to uh, hopefully talking to you soon. Gabby? Thanks, everyone. Uh, we'll be sending out a recorded version of the session today and as well as the PowerPoint presentation for you to review. Um, if you requested demos, we'll make sure that someone from the Areva team and someone from Double the Donation gets in contact with you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.